Tonight on Access TV, it's Gotham Comedy Live. Get ready to laugh with Jason Lawhead, Justy Dodge, Brian Moot, Joe Matarese, and your host, Mick Foley. Gotham Comedy Live, all happening right now. Ladies and gentlemen, Mick Foley. Now that, that that's a response. Uh, thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be here, right here in New York City. For those of you who are watching at home or not wrestling fans, that's what we call a cheap pop in wrestling. And it worked well here, right here in New York City. Yeah. As you might be able to tell by the, the pose there, I am known primarily as a wrestler, but uh, don't dismay. If you're not a fan, don't worry. I'm not going to rest on my wrestling laurels, uh, even though I am in the WWE Hall of Fame. Yeah. Uh, Was a three-time, uh, one, two, three-time WWE champion. Uh, uh, I'm not gonna rest on those laurels. Three, three times, that's impressive. <laughs> I was doing the math on the way over here tonight and I was figured out that I've wrestled in 49 states, 37 countries on six different continents. And when you travel the world for the last 29 years like I have, you, you run into some peculiar people, some interesting people. And you travel with these interesting people and you sometimes find that when you travel long enough with these unique, interesting people that they have idiosyncrasies and peculiarities that can lead to problems while you are traveling. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you one of those road stories involving a couple of gentlemen that some of you may be familiar with. One of them is named Stone Cold Steve Austin. <laughs> And uh, trust me, even if you're not familiar with this gentleman, you will become very familiar with him in a few minutes. A certain Diamond Dallas Page. Uh, who may be referred to as DDP or Page for short throughout this story. Like I said, everyone's got their own idiosyncrasies and, and Diamond Dallas Page, unbeknownst to most people, was actually the first wrestler to introduce thumbtacks into the world of professional wrestling. Did anybody know that? He didn't wrestle with them. No, he didn't use them on me. What did he do? He'd use them. He would thumbtack the blinds to the walls of our piece of crap $30 econo lodges. <laughs> so as not to let in any of the faintest ray of sunshine or man-made light. And you might say, okay, why would three like superstar wrestlers need to triple up in a piece of crap $30 econo lodge? And it's simple mathematics because a $30 piece of crap room split three ways is how much per person? Math. 10 bucks split two ways, a savings of, multiplied by roughly 300 nights a year on the road. You can buy a lot of custom made Santa Claus shirts for that kind of money. Take a look at that bad boy. Now, thumb tagging the blinds to the walls in idiosyncrasy, not necessarily a problem. The problem began with the fact that Diamond Dallas Page was one of those random white guys who liked to be naked for no apparent reason. Uh, I'd been around people who liked to be naked with reason, and he wasn't one of them. Uh, not that I'm anybody's pecker checker, but he was more or less like an average white guy. And in the days before manscaping, that could be problematic. <laughs> so while in retrospect, the mature adult thing to do would have been to have a discussion with him about the option of wearing more clothing, we instead, along with Stone Cold Steve Austin, decided it would be more fun to psychologically crack Diamond Dallas Page, <laughs> to emotionally devastate him on the road to the point where he would request a change of room. So we started it out. Now, in fairness to Page, he would not be completely naked. I don't want you to get the wrong impression. He would actually wear saran wrap around his knees, <laughs> which he claimed helped lubricate the joints. And so in the total and absolute darkness, you could not see him but you could hear him crinkling as he walked. <laughs> when... So we started out on this uh, seven day road trip into the deep southern United States. 
We ended up sizing it up like a prize fight with a couple of nice jabs. Stone Cold said, yeah, my old lady wanted me to pick up a couple of antiques while I was on the road. And I said, what did you tell her? And he said, I told her I picked up Paige at the airport. <laughs> Boom! A solid jab at the aging Paige delivered 22 years ago to give you, give you some idea of how old this gentleman is right now. By mid-afternoon, he was ready to go, ready to the point where he's threatening me lovable Santa Claus custom-made shirt wearing me <laughs> with physical violence threatening to throw me over the top of the balcony of our piece of crappy Econo Lodge. A threat I was not intimidated by in the least <laughs> for two key reasons. Number one, because I had been on hand in Baltimore, Maryland as a fan in the sixth throw in 1991 when I was trying to get my foot back in the WCW World Championship Wrestling door as a fan, I saw Diamond Dallas Page being clotheslined over the top rope by the Z-Man, Tom Zank, a clothesline that was not altogether successful. <laughs> there's, there's nothing wrong with that, nothing to be ashamed of, moves uh, misfire all the time, and I've got a missing ear to prove it. <laughs> Are some of you not aware of that? Huh? You're aware you came to see a one-eared man here? Oh, well, I can't show it, I'll show you a magic trick here. See, uh, there we go, left ear, no problem, right? Watch this. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> uh, my mouth is dry. This is live TV. It's my first time. I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> what is not understandable? or forgivable in the least is when DDP did not complete his journey the first time with the help of the Z-Man. He attempted to make that journey by himself a second time. He just kind of threw himself over backwards, a journey which once again was not successful. <laughs> so therefore, when he threatened to throw me right over the top of the effing balcony, I just calmly stood there and said, hey, that's a good idea, Paige, and if uh, I don't make it the first time with you helping me, I'll just throw myself over the second time. <laughs> but the primary reason why I was not intimidated by Diamond Dallas Page and not fearful at all for my personal well-being is because, well, it's because, well, he, he's, he's a good dude. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. He does his DDP yoga thing. Like, he improves <laughs> lives. He breathes life back into these aging wrestlers, probably successful in resuscitating Jake Roberts' life and his career. And so therefore, I, try, I tried to reason with him. I just sat down. I said, Dallas, maybe, um, um, I, maybe we'd be more comfortable if you'd start wearing clothes <laughs> in the room. And he looked at me like it was the most absurd request he'd ever heard. He just said, but bro, they get in the way. And it was as he walked to the shower that I felt very much like Travis at the end of Old Yeller. <laughs> I realized I had to put a bullet in his brain. <laughs> Not a literal bullet. A bullet in the form of the 48 to 60, four to five dozen delicious home-baked chocolate chip Toll House cookies that a helpful fan had baked for us to ease the tedium of the road. So while Paige went into that shower, I went into action. When he came out, we couldn't see him, but we could hear him crinkling as he walked, sounding. <laughs> and it took him about 30 seconds to realize that he was not alone in that bed. That he was sharing that bed with 48 to 60 delicious home-baked chocolate chip dollhouse cookies. When he came to that realization, he was upset, and he let his anger be shown in a tirade where he said, I want to know right now who put cookies in my... Here's, oh shoot, um, I don't know if you guys know this, I don't, I don't actually curse. And I can't really do this story that I've, one, I'll drop one, okay? I wanna know right now, but cookies are my, no, here's, here's the problem. To this story justice, uh, I need a lot of F-bombs. Um, volunteer, we got a volunteer. Monique, you're pretty good at dropping an F-bomb there. We got a, any volunteers out here, maybe a specialist, somebody. Uh, Wait, I'm being told, ladies and gentlemen, we have the real DDP here. Ladies and gentlemen, DDP.
When he realized he was not alone in that bed, he let his anger known by saying, I want to know right now who put cookies in my fucking bed. I said, I want to know right fucking now who put fucking cookies in my fucking bed. In the darkness, in the absolute darkness, there's no way he could have known who the perpetrator was. And let's say the perpetrator could not control his rapid in and out inhalation noise of sounding something like this. <laughs> At which point he said, you, you, you put cookies in my fucking bed. You put fucking cookies in my fucking bed. You put fucking cookies in my fucking bed, you no good motherfucker. In the darkness, I can only describe gathering noises. He picked up as many of the offensive crumbs and chunks as he could, carried them over to my side of the bed, threw back my sheets, threw them on my prone body, and began jumping, leaping up and down, shouting, There! There! How do you like it when someone puts cookies in your fucking bed? How do you fucking like it when someone fucking puts cookies in your fucking bed? <laughs> to be honest, I thought the question was merely rhetorical. <laughs> actually gave me a chance to answer. So I just said, um, uh, you know, Dallas, it's uh, not so much the cookies I mind as it is your naked ass <laughs> rubbing all over me. <laughs> At that point, he got up and walked away slowly, mournfully. I, I couldn't see him, but I could hear him crinkling as he went, going. <laughs> Sounded nothing like that. Uh, <laughs> and he laid down in that small cot in the corner of the room. After what seemed like minutes, he finally said, You know what, guys? Tomorrow, I think I'm gonna get my own fucking room. <laughs> Bang! Bang! Listen, stay tuned. We got more great Gotham Live. Thanks so much for being there. I'm Mick Foley, your host, and we'll see you in a minute. presentation of Gotham Comedy Live. More laughs right now. Welcome back to the Access TV presentation of Gotham Comedy Live. More laughs right now. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready for your first comic? You can see him as a host of his own podcast, Lawhead's Court. Say hello to Jason Lawhead. Yeah. yeah, what's up, New York? How are you? Yes. Exciting, I'll tell you, this is the place to be live from, man. It's so good to come here. This is the energy, this town, you people come out, no matter what the weather is, you seek live entertainment like God intended it with other human beings, right? You're not at home living your lives on a status update, telling people what you're doing all day on Facebook, like, we give a shit. Do you have these friends every five minutes, their problems are yours? He's like, laundry, laundry, laundry. Just stop typing it and go do it, how about that? Apparently you have three loads that need to be done from what I'm reading. At that age now where I'm still single, but all my friends I grew up with, they're having kids and families. They want to tell you about their kids' day on Facebook. It's like, listen, I'm not Tanner's friend. I don't really give a shit what he or she is doing. I don't even know what a Tanner is. Is that a boy or a girl? What is a Tanner? So he's like, Tanner's got soccer. Maybe we'll get pizza. Like, who gives a shit? Listen, I'm the youngest of seven Irish Catholics, originally from Cleveland, Ohio. I would have loved to seen my old man have that when we were growing up, telling his friends what we were up to on Facebook all day. They'd log in and see like, hey, just beat my kid for getting in the liquor cabinet. Like, what? <laughs> Two minutes ago? That's terrible, I can't. You think we should comment on this at all? <laughs> My mom would give the thumbs up like she liked to stand us. Like, no, what the fuck? 
you know, because that's the thing. That's where we're living in this day. You, know, you could be at home watching reality TV, you know, rotting your brain with that mush. It's like 20 years later, it's more popular than it's ever been. It's like, when did not having a talent become a talent in this country? It's like <laughs> keeping up with the Kardashians. It's like, what are we still keeping up with at this point? How pathetic Bruce Jenner's life turned out? Is that a, this sad sack of shit, the only person with talent in the whole family just sloughing around the house, four Armenian broads nagging his ass, five, if you count Chloe twice, you're just looking at him like... <laughs> Really, Bruce? This is what it's come to for you, huh? This is what you... He finally left her, thank God, two months ago. I give him credit. I mean, somebody finally had to knock some sense into him. One of his friends would be like, dude, what are you doing? Like, step away from the camera, Bruce. You know, you were on the Wheaties box. You remember that, right? You were a gold medal decathlete, which means you've been trained 10 ways to escape this situation. <laughs> Run, bike, swim. Throw a javelin in her face. Just get the fuck out of there. That's not even plastic surgery. That's just a look of shock on Bruce's face. Like, how the fuck did I get myself into this shit? I follow Kim on Twitter just because it's amusing how stupid she is. I recommend you do the same. It's oh, entertainment for hours. It's great. A couple weeks ago, she was at lunch. She tweeted, I love the taste of iced tea. Of course you do. He's a black rapper. What the fuck? <laughs> Tweet us some shit we don't know, Kim. That's the point here, you know what I mean? It's unbelievable. Great to be here in New York, though, man. I think about moving here all the time until I come here and get weather like this, and then I'm like, I don't know about that, because I love this city, but you've never heard of me, right? I, I'm like two canceled gigs away from being homeless at any time. I can't be homeless. So it's much nicer to be homeless in LA, because you know, the worst thing you worry about is a little melanoma on your nose, you know, that's about it. Because out here, I mean, you can't make any money. Nobody takes their hands out of their pockets. It's too cold. <laughs> L.A., they just, you know, was a, they just put a lawn chair up at a highway exit and a red light. They pull up a book. It's like drive through panhandling. Like, I'm taking their order. You ever been out there? <laughs> and I'm a nice guy. I'm from the Midwest, but I don't make a lot of money. You've never heard of me, right? I feel bad for these guys. I'm always pulling up behind some guy in like a 2028 BMW, always like powering his windows up as this poor guy walks by. Meanwhile, I'm always rolling my window down to explain to this guy why I can't give him five cents. I'm <laughs> pointing at features on my car like, dude, you see the broken headlight and the cracked windshield? I mean, when this thing breaks down, I'm you, you know what I mean? <laughs> I got Sharpies and cardboard in the trunk. I'm ready to be you right now. <laughs> And I know how to spell help, so I'm going to have a leg up on you. Don't do that, man. I got a, I got a big sports fan. This is a great sports city. I love coming here. I'm a huge sports fan. I, I love sports. but uh, Yeah, but I'm from Cleveland, though, so it's a hard to be a, believe me. Yes, the Browns. We'll try watching them. Try being a Browns fan. Watching the Browns play anybody on television is like watching two people play Madden with one of the controllers broken. You're just like... <laughs> I, I don't know. My guys just keep running out of bounds. Oh, they're, they're all out of bounds. I fucking hate this game. I won't even go home for Christmas anymore because of the Browns. The Browns are my brother-in-law. He's a re-gifter. Yeah, he likes to give you shit. You know, nobody wants, like, Browns tickets in December. You know what I mean? He's that guy. He's always calling me early before my flight. Like, dude, that Sunday before, I got us Browns Bills tickets. I'm like, what the fuck did I do to you? You know what I mean? Like... You're having sex with my sister, and this is how you repay me, with Browns and Bills tickets. Let me guess, upper deck facing the lake, end of December. Yeah, what a great way to see who gets the third pick in the draft. This is gonna be sweet. I told him that for my tickets, we're not even gonna go to the game, we're gonna watch it at a nice warm bar. I tried donating the tickets to a local charity. The lady was like, you know, these kids have been through enough already, don't you? <laughs> Chained in a basement for 10 years, and you wanna take them to a Browns game, you sick bastard? I gotta have hot, real sports, man. Hockey's the only real sport left in this country, right? It's the only one, it's the only one you can depend on. It's the only one you can depend on, right? Every other sport, baseball's full of steroids and cheaters. You don't even know who the best player was in the last 30 years, you know? Basketball, convinced it's fixed. I mean, how's a seven foot guy fall down when somebody brushes up against him? <laughs> NFL, you're not allowed to hit anybody anymore unless you kill him in the off season, but hockey is, 
hockey. Hockey's the greatest sport there is, because I love a hockey game, because you can watch a hockey game. The most exciting thing is there's a million things going on with absolutely nothing happening. You ever watch a hockey game? It's unbelievable. It's like Forsberg's got it out of the corner, and he clears the puck ahead across the blue line. There's a two-on-one. He sends a shot, and that misses, and it's gathered in off the rails, and now there's a toss check, and now Viderberg's got it. Zyderberg across the blue line on a power play. He sends a wrister, denied, and it comes back off the rails, and now they're going to three-on-one, and it's Malkin, Malkin ahead to Crosby. Crosby sends a shot. And Crawford says no, and you're like, dude, you gotta get in here. This game's amazing. What's the score? There isn't one, but it's awesome. It's like my life. My life is like a hockey game, because you've never heard of me, right? Uh, I'm that comic. I got like a million things going on, but nothing really happening. I'm not accomplishing anything out of a hockey announcer. Just broadcast my failures in life everywhere I go. Like, Lawhead goes on stage, tries a new joke. That misses. Like, ah! Oh. <laughs> Lawhead goes down to the bank for an extended line of credit. Denied! Oh, no. <laughs> Lawhead meets a hot girl, takes her out for dinner and drinks, asks her to come home. She says no! And let them out. Hey, that's my time. My name's Jason Lawhead. You guys are awesome, New York. Thank you very much. Stay tuned for more laughs on Access TV. Live from the Gotham Comedy Club in New York City, Justy Dodge is taking the stage when we return. I know how to throw a Pardukey or what? Right. Enjoying ourselves on Access TV, our next comedian, she's making her TV debut. So be nice. Anyone thinking of being mean? Got my eyes on you. Because we bonded over the fact that she picked up my first book when she was 14. She, sh she shoplifted it. Uh, and then had to throw it in a Perkins parking lot because the police were on her trail. Say hello to Justy Dodge. Hello. I did shoplift that book and I did have the alarm go off. It was awesome. I loved wrestling growing up. I was kind of a tomboy, I think that's the thing. You know what I mean? Like, the only reason I had Barbies is because my Ninja Turtles needed bitches. <laughs> yeah. I was just never like a girly type of girl, you know? Like, I never wore makeup really. Like, lipstick freaks me out. I don't know why. The bright red and pink lipstick, though. For dudes, I don't get the appeal of that, other than it looks like a bullseye for your cock. <laughs> I think the girliest thing I ever did is I got into witchcraft. <laughs> because I wanted to make my tits bigger. was I just really had this obsession like I wanted big boobs you know like not like I wanted to be titty fucked but I just wanted the option <laughs> just wanted to be able to say no to something because I can't do that when men ask me to marry them <laughs> I've been engaged a chunk of times I've been engaged a few times First time I got engaged is because the guy asked me in front of people. <laughs> you guys missed that. In front of people is what I said. That's why I had to, because I'm not a dick. <laughs> and I really need a dental. <laughs> yeah. He, uh, he's romantic and he proposed to me in a bar. And because I've got that gaping hole six inches below my belly button that gives me feelings and emotions I did not want or ask for, <laughs> I started to cry. But the bartender looked over at like the wrong moment and she thought he hit me. <laughs> so you just hear from across the bar, what did he do to you? 
And without even skipping a beat, I just ran up and I'm like, no, 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 it's okay. <laughs> he loves me. <laughs> when we broke up, uh, we wanted to be adults about it, right? So we both went on Facebook, changed our relationship statuses to single, and then liked each other's. It's what you do when you're a grown-up. <laughs> I'm married now to a different guy. It's gross. Uh, <laughs> guys are always way more excited about that. Men are like, yeah, gross. And chicks are like, aw. We've been married for a year, and uh, right after we got married, he bought me the e-cigarette. Because he wanted me to give up smoking. And I was like, I just gave up other men. <laughs> Why are you trying to change me? I did quit smoking one time. I did it for eight days. I actually did it on our honeymoon. honeymoon. I'm not an asshole in this, okay? I understand. My husband for our honeymoon took me to Fort Myers, Florida for two and a half weeks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Is anyone, is anyone here from Fort Myers, Florida? Are you really? You don't do that to somebody you love. <laughs> Every, everybody likes my husband more than me, which is upsetting. Like, I get it, he's a really good person. He's got nice hair and he smells like a mother should. <laughs> But anywhere I go, that's the first thing people will ask me about. They're like, oh my God, where's James? What's going on with James? What's new with James? <laughs> I now know what it feels like to have a hotter sister. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, never got to sleep with a black guy. Oh. And now I technically can't. And I think that's why I voted for Obama. That's all I had laugh, left to piss off my father. <laughs> but nope, I settled for the white guy who refers to sex as buddy time. <laughs> yep. He called me the other day, my husband, and I didn't answer because I didn't want to talk to him. So he just assumed I was dead? <laughs> That's pretty extreme, right? Like he really needs to stop freaking out. And I really need to stop saying I'm gonna kill myself. <laughs> He's dyslexic though, so whenever we get in a fight, I just hang up the phone and start texting him. He just went vegan, because he's an asshole. <laughs> I feel like if you just watch enough Netflix documentaries, you learn to fear anything fun in life. <laughs> and my friends tell me I need to be more supportive because it's really hard to be a vegan. You have to give up meat and dairy. And I'm like, yeah, well, I used to be anorexic and I gave up everything. <laughs> That is far more impressive than not eating cheese. <laughs> I did, I, I used to be anorexic because I couldn't afford to be bulimic. <laughs> All right. I have a friend who really likes to say the word delish. Like a lot, like everything is delish. Like I'm delish, my hair's delish, we're just delish. <laughs> the only time it is acceptable to say the word delish is if somebody punches you in the face in the middle of trying to say delicious. <laughs> right? 
All right, guys, thanks so much. I'm Justy Dodge. Stay tuned for more laughs on Access TV. Live from the Gotham Comedy Club in New York City, Brian Moot is taking the stage when we return. wrestler in the audience it's been a couple years last time I saw him uh, he did a move to try to impress me destroyed his shoulder and his whole life's been downhill from there right <laughs> correct to say okay good to see you again yeah. all right <laughs> I want to make a point about our next comic but it's not a moot point ladies and gentlemen you've seen him on MTV say hello to Brian Moot yeah. <laughs> New York City I could totally take that guy. <laughs> I've got strong shoulders. <laughs> uh, for one year of my life, you guys, I was an elementary school teacher. And I want to tell you something right now, if you're wondering, that is not a job that you can do with a hangover <laughs> ever because punching kids in the face is illegal. You can't do that. Yeah, you can't even choke them out either. You believe that? You can't even be like, shh. Nap time, nap time, nap time, shh, shh. Like, I'm not a monster, I do it like a professional, you know what I'm saying, just shh. Lay them down gently like the angels they should be acting like, <laughs> There you go, little buddy, real quiet in my classroom. <laughs> Perfect learning environment. Cause I had no idea, I had no idea little kindergartners are gonna be such jerks every single day mean and they were cocky about it. Every day they roll in, they're just tiny jerks that know you can't kill them. So they just roll in like, yo, what is peeing my pants right now? What are you gonna do about it? What? Yeah, I got spares in the bag, you get them. I went to college, what's college? You're an idiot. <laughs> it's awful, every day. Every single day, they'd ask questions that made me want to quit. Like one day, this kid was like, hey, yo, Mr. B, why are you so sweaty right now? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, all right, all right. Okay, there we go. Yeah, okay. Thanks for asking that question. Uh, I'm having what's called an anxiety attack right now. <laughs> Because I just realized, I don't know how to spell receive on the whiteboard. That's what's happening. <laughs> there are too many vowels in that word. Are you serious? I's, E's, more E's, a C that sounds like an S. Yeah. I don't know if you guys know this, there is no autocorrect on a whiteboard. That does not exist. It is no replacements every single time. I quit teaching because of the word unnecessary. That is why I retired. <laughs> Have you tried that word puzzle freehand? You gotta take a nap halfway through it. <laughs> is it the whiteboard just like, it is un Un-skek-skersker? We'll put an infinity sign over that N right there. And we'll factor a Y over the sk You know what, who wants a nap right now? My favorite day teaching though, hands down, school picture day, because that is the worst day of every elementary school kid's life. That is a conspiracy to ruin your life in the future. Every kid shows up on picture day like it was an emergency that they left the house. Like bomb raid sirens are blowing off. And their mom kicked in their bedroom door like, hurry, get out of bed and put this tiny sweater vest on. <laughs> Trust me. None of you have ever looked at a little headshot you got at eight years old and thought, yup, nailed it. Oh, damn. Oh, so glad I wore that Ninja Turtles sweatshirt that morning. Oh, covered in SpaghettiO stains. <laughs> 
But here's what I blame the most for it. Here's whose fault it is. The photographer at the school, that person. Because that person's a grown up. They know where this ends. They could stop it from happening. They don't even try. They just look at these little train wreck kids through a camera lens and just go. <laughs> so glad you wore a turtleneck shirt. Those never go out of style. How'd you know that? <laughs> Oh yeah, you tuck that shirt into your jeans. <laughs> right into the elastic band at acid wash. You tuck that shirt in. Oh my God. Do you have a rat tail haircut right now? <laughs> okay, you put that down the front. What are you, crazy? <laughs> Chest out. <laughs> Be proud of that furry little tail. That looks like a ferret riding shotgun in your life right now. Let's be honest, that's a rare look. We're gonna have my assistant put some colorful beads in that thing real quick. Cause that's gonna comment the neon lasers we're about to fire through the background of this picture. <laughs> yeah, your mom checked that box cause she's awesome, all right? <laughs> you know what, let's go big in this masterpiece. Do this pose for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Oh, and you're missing a tooth too? You look like a hillbilly cheerleader. <laughs> this is why I got in the game. Bonus feature, also in the background, we're gonna put another picture of you looking off whimsically into a distance, just like. <laughs> like you're about to start singing in the sound of music, like. That's the future you could have. That is a morning person job, teaching. Yeah, I am not a morning person. If you are a morning person in this room right now, good for you, but please appreciate this. At some point in time in your morning person life, everybody you know has thought about murdering you. Yeah, right? And not just kind of murdering you, they've thought it all the way through the process while they looked at you in the eyes. They've thought through the logistics. Do I own a boat? Do I know how to work a chop saw? Maybe I should watch all of season one of Dexter right now, real quick. Just brush up on the code. Because when you're not a morning person, you get violence and aggression in the morning. You, you don't do it, but you fantasize about it, right? Like, you know you're not a morning person. You've ever been driving your car, 7.30 a.m., and you see a jogger on the side of the road, right? Yeah like way too happy to be out of bed. You know one of those people frolicking down the side of the road like a happy deer from a Disney movie, right? <laughs> Ponytail swinging back and forth with a sassy attitude, like. <laughs> hey, look at me. I'm out of bed on purpose. <laughs> I have an E-Trade account. Why wouldn't I wear nothing but yoga pants every single day? And you see that person and you think in your mind, Poof! oh, you plow them over for morning person justice. Just flinch at them, I could have done it. Ah! Relax, morning people, you don't, we don't do that and you don't die like that. You would never die like that. You're too annoying to die like that. You would just bounce off of the car like, ah, look who's up early, Mr. Grumpy Pants. And you just frolic <laughs> off. <laughs> I don't need coffee because I'm so high on life today. Yeah, you hear that, put your car in reverse and go after them. Cause I, I didn't know kids are morning people. I had no idea. Kids are up early, 5 a.m. every single day. They're out of bed, giving themselves haircuts with butter knives. and <laughs> Trying to turn on your barbecue to go get egg old waffles. I had to babysit my five-year-old godson for one day during Christmas. One day and one morning, this monster woke me up from a dead sleep by just staring at me. <laughs> Jesus Christ, does it happen to you? That is terrifying. Do you know how much evil a child has to possess in their heart to set off your body's fight or flight instincts while you're sleeping? You're dead asleep and your body's like, wake up, moron. You're about to get your Hot Wheels right in the face and you don't have dental insurance. <laughs> All right, I gotta go, you guys. Thank you very much, you're wonderful people. Happy birthday, Dad. Love you guys. Thank you. Stay tuned for more laughs on Access TV.
Audience, live from the Gotham Comedy Club in New York City, Joe Matteris is taking the stage when we return. Welcome back to the Access TV presentation of Gotham Comedy Live. More laughs right now. Are you ready? Are you ready for our final comic of the evening? A lot of pressure on this young man because all of our comics have been outstanding. He's kind of our main event, but I come from the WWE where we never disappoint with our main events. So May, if I can, can we have a drum roll, please? Please welcome from the David Letterman Show, Mr. Joe Matteris. Yeah. All right, man, I like the energy. I like the energy, folks. I, I could tell we're New Yorkers, man. I could just feel it, man. This week has been brutal, right? We've had like two snowstorms. It's been, it's been, let's just say, it's been fucking brutal. But seriously, if you're a real New Yorker, you can remember three years ago, I'll never forget it, 39 inches of snow in the month of January, okay? And I blamed my wife for all 39 inches. <laughs> Check this out, because she uh, talked me out of buying a snowblower that December. Yeah, I don't know if you knew this about getting married and what happens, but you can't just go buy something after that. You can't see something you want and just grab it. Oh, get a snowblower. My wife's like, where, do you, wh wh where are you going with that? I'm like, uh, we need this, we need this. She goes, no, we don't. We'll just hire a guy every time it snows. Yeah, that's how much snow we got that winter. There was no guy, okay? Yeah, do you know how much it has to snow for Mexican people not to want to work? Yeah. That's a positive racist joke, so those are hard to write. Yeah. Even Mexicans were like, yo, that's a lot of snow, bro. Shit, you should have bought the snowblower, man. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking snow, man. Anyone got the wife who doesn't help you with the shoveling? She just waves to you from the picture window? <laughs> holding both my kids. Oh, wave at daddy! You gotta be fucking shitting me, are you serious? Put some fucking boots on, bitch. Let's do this. I don't even want to live in this house. We're near your whole fucking family. <laughs> oh, God. I do, I do, I have two kids, man. I have, I have a six-year-old and a one-year-old, and oh my God. It is, the best part about being a parent is it becomes really easy to have a good time once you have kids. All you have to do is just not be with your kids. <laughs> Right, parents? Right? Yeah, you just walk out your front door. You're like, are we in the Bahamas? I don't know. No, we're just on the front porch. Oh, it feels fucking great. I don't know. And, and there's also a lot of acting involved in being a parent. A lot of pretending you give a shit. Like, I could be nominated for an Oscar for some of my performances. Yeah, the category B, and the nominees for best giving a shit <laughs> in a non-giving a shit situation. <laughs> Luke's father, Joe, for saying, yeah, that really is a cool leaf. Now, <laughs> uh, and I, I'm too old to have little ones, man. I'm 46 with a six-year-old and a one-year-old, man. It's kicking the shit out of me, man. Oh, yeah. Like, the, here's a sign I'm getting old. This really happened recently. I, I'm watching porn on the internet. I'm not that old. You know, I wasn't watching it on a VHS tape. But I did live through those days. Remember when you had to go to, like, a, a West Coast video or something and had like a, had, like, a porn room off to the right? 
right? And you, had, you were embarrassed to go in that porn room, so you had to look around, you had to make a right and a quick left. <laughs> and then you were in, you're like, oh, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. Right? It's like six married guys on a knee pulling boxes out. <laughs> now this is how old I am. I'm watching porn on the internet recently. This comes out of my mouth. I go, whoa, that is a really nice couch. <laughs> it's a good one. It was, the, uh, it was the Maxwell from Restoration Hardware. I, I, I bought it two days later. I highly recommend it. The thing could take a beating. It's a fucking awesome couch. Yes, but, but he, here's another beauty of being older. You have wisdom, man, because I see a lot of young people in the crowd, and you, you, you got to listen to this, especially the young guys. Young girls, too. You always think when you're young that you need to be with a 10, right? You're like, oh, I got to get a 10. I need to be with a 10. No, you don't, okay? I've been married for eight years. You know what you need? You need someone who's beneath you <laughs> in every category, right? <laughs> yes, because if you're a nine and they're a one, you know what you get? Freedom. Yeah. yeah. You could do whatever the hell you want if you're the nine. She'll try to stop you at first. She'll be like, hey, I don't think you should go on that long golf trip. <laughs> like, sh sh shut up, one, and you just walk out the door. Right? Next day, you're hitting golf balls at your friends. You're not even thinking about her. Can you believe she tried to stop me from coming out here? <laughs> Shit, that's going towards the hole. And I think it explains why John Lennon's second wife was Yoko Ono. Think about it. His first wife was probably a gorgeous model, right? And at some point he was like, I can't fucking take her anymore. <laughs> this girl's all up in my shit. Right? And he got rid of her. And then he met Yoko Ono, a negative six. <laughs> now, I, see, I, I didn't take my own advice, okay? I've been married eight years to a woman who is smarter than me, better looking than me, and makes more money than me. I can't get away with shit, okay? <laughs> My wife installed a, a, a webcam in my dick hole a couple weeks ago. Yeah, she's, she's watching right now. It's going well, they're really a good crowd. They seem to like me so far. And, and all her friends are really rich too, man. And I, one of her friends makes like four or 500,000 a year, right? And his wife is like a stay-at-home mom. Now, I don't know if you ever watched a couple where one person makes all the money and the other person doesn't really make any money. The way they interact, totally different than the way my wife and I interact. This guy was like spur of the moment. It's like five of one on a Sunday during the football season. I'm at his house. He's like, shit, Joe, football. Let's go, me and you. We drive to Philly. We eat some cheesesteaks, roast pork sandwiches. We watch football for like six hours. Honey, watch the kids while we're gone, and we'll be back in about seven hours. Have a nice dinner ready for us, all right? See you later. And he just walks out the door. <laughs> now, I'm standing there in front of my wife like, Am I allowed to go with him? Because <laughs> I would love to go if I could go with him. Yeah. Yeah. She didn't let me go. She didn't let me go. I had to rub her feet for like 20 minutes. Sometimes I think maybe a non-American wife would be a good way to go, right? Did you ever see, like, my wife's cousin married this Brazilian woman. This was blowing my mind. We spent the summer in a summer rental with them, right? She's nine months pregnant. She's cooking and cleaning for 10 of us in a house. And now she's disciplining everybody's kids all at once. <laughs> I had to pull her aside. I'm like, how the hell are you pulling this off? This is blowing my mind. She goes, in Brazil, we are taught at an early age to be great wives. And I was like, I was like, my wife was taught at an early age to teach her husband how to be a great wife. <laughs> I'm Joe Matteris, thank you guys.
stay tuned for more laughs on Access TV, live from the Gotham Comedy Club in New York City. Welcome back to the Access TV presentation of Gotham Comedy Live. More laughs happening right now. Thank you. Yes, we've had a great time, have we not? Well, on a serious note, as someone who's been performing in one way or another for 29 years, people think it's easy. Don't try to imitate what professionals do. That's the reason they do it. They're professionals. So whatever you do, don't make your own home porno videos. Uh, it never works out. And my wife's watch is going to hurt her tremendously, but the rest of my life, I have to look at that woman and realize I've married someone with enormous hands. Back there. All right, let's bring it for our comics. Come on up there. Jason Lawhead, Justy Dodge, Brian Moot, Joe Matteris. And a special round of applause. Wearing the blonde wig in the role of DDP, Jennifer Bloodsworth. Thank you. You guys are awesome. 